Good morning and a very warm welcome to our service of Holy Communion this morning. Delighted to be back. I feel like I've been away for weeks. <laughs> I think it's three weeks I've missed. Um, so it's lovely to, to be with you all again this morning. Um, I don't think I have any notices to give unless anybody's got any that aren't on the notices or have been scrolling through our um, PowerPoint. You know, in which case, please do join us for coffee afterwards um, so that we can have some time together. But we will stand and sing our first hymn. Let all the world... In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. We pray together our prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned, thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Mighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remain standing to sing the Gloria together. <laughs>
for this third, third Sunday after Trinity and feast day for St. Thomas. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, who for the firmer foundation of our faith allowed your holy apostle Thomas to doubt the resurrection of your son till word and sight convinced him. Grant to us who have not seen that we also may believe and so confess Christ as our Lord and our God, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please do be seated for our first reading. A reading from the Epistle to the Ephesians. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to stand to sing our gradual hymn now. Father, hear the prayer. Please would you stand? the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the side of the nails, in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we celebrate Thomas, the Apostle, and we hear of his doubt after that first Easter morning. I was very fortunate to be at two ordination services yesterday, one in Portsmouth in the morning and one in Winchester in the afternoon. And in Winchester, the preacher preached on this passage. It was useful for a priest about to, to preach on the same passage. She didn't say very much different to what I'm going to say this morning, but one thing she did say, looking at all the ordinance, uh, all the, they were deacons being priested um, yesterday, being ordained priest. She looked at them all and said, we know that even you will have had doubts. Doubt for many is scary. We often run from doubt, especially when it concerns God, faith, Christianity, Jesus. But instead we can lean on it, we can embrace it, we can allow it to become our teacher. It's hard to admit, admit that you've had doubts. And I know that because, like many, I have had doubts. Would it surprise you to hear that many of the greatest Christians throughout time have had serious doubts and questions about their faith? Experiencing spiritual doubt can be lonely, but it's much more common than you think. Most Christians have at some point experienced a time of spiritual doubt when they questioned what they believed about their religion or about God. But many make it through the other side stronger for having faced their honest questions. For John Calvin, one of the fathers of Protestantism, doubting your faith is something to expect, not something to fear. Doubt, according to Calvin, was a part of his faith experience. He even stated that unbelief is in all men always mixed with faith. Calvin understood that spiritual doubt manifests itself because ideas about God are usually above and beyond the capacity of human nature. And Pope Francis said, who among us who among us has not experienced insecurity, loss, and even doubts on their journey of faith? Everyone. We've all experienced this. Me too. It's part of the journey of faith. It's part of our lives. This should not surprise us. Because we are human beings marked by fragility and limitations, we are all weak. We are, all have limits. But do not panic. We all have them. According to the Pope, doubt is an essential part of faith. Certainty to him is ungodly. Instead, one should always be humble enough to leave room for doubt and steer clear of certainty. Last week, we celebrated our patronal festival for John the Baptist. And we need to look no further than the Bible to read stories of faith and challenges of doubt. Surprisingly though, one of these characters is no other than John the Baptist. He had complete faith that Jesus was the Messiah. However, 
in Matthew chapter 11, verse 3, and Luke chapter 7, verse 19, John the Baptist sent messengers to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist's doubts had merit. It was reasonable for him to have these doubts, for during this time he was in prison for over a year, awaiting execution. And when Jesus received his message, he didn't rebuke John the Baptist. He understood completely the struggle of John and why he was facing these doubts. From this, we can see that even during Jesus's time, doubt and faith go hand in hand. One of the hardest things about doubt is admitting that it's there. Our beliefs often feel like dominoes. If one wobbles, a whole lot will come down. And doubts often start small. Is there any point in praying? Yet one question quickly leads to another. Does God hear? Does God care? And finally, is God even there? When such doubts begin to nag, we can even envy our atheist friends. They let their unbelief hang out while we must keep ours hidden. How can you admit doubt if you're a PCC member, a home group leader, or employed by a Christian organisation? How can you speak of unbelief when you're part of a family of believers? But such doubts are there, and like weeds, they grow when unattended. If we don't confront them, they'll soon confront us. So how should we respond? Some things to remember. Every unbeliever has faith. Don't look wistfully at your unbelieving friends as if they don't have to bother with faith. Everyone, even the most hardened atheist, relies on commitments and foundations they can't see or prove. We all take for granted the regularity of the universe, the reliability of our senses, the rationality of our minds. None of these can be proved scientifically. They're all matters of faith. But without Christ, they have no true, beautiful and loving foundation. If you think you're having a crisis of faith, you can be sure it's nothing compared to the crisis of faith that is atheism. Doubt is a part of being human. At times, I'm sure we've all doubted our marriage, our friends, our reason, our cooking, our writing, and ourselves. It would be odd if we didn't doubt God at times. More than this, doubt is an inevitable part of a Christian experience. This is why Jesus continually was chiding his disciples, saying, O oh, you of little faith. Sometimes we sin and sometimes we doubt. Neither is good in themselves, but they're not surprising or unexpected. A doubtless Christian is as impossible as a sinless Christian. Sin springs from unbelief. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9 says, If we say we have no doubts, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our doubts, God is faithful and just to forgive us our doubts. And our feelings go up and down with blood sugar. If we let our feelings take the wheel of our lives, they'll crush our jobs, our marriage, our faith many times over. Some of us are Eeyores and some of us are Tiggers. That doesn't make the Tiggers the heroes of faith, it just makes them lucky. We must surround ourselves with the scriptures and the people of the scriptures, so we keep soaking in what is true. And faith isn't a thing we muster up and push out. Faith is simply resting on Jesus. When we focus on him, Rather on the hymn of Jesus rather than the what of faith, 
doubts are reduced, replaced and even redeemed. Thomas had doubts and demanded to see and touch the scars of Jesus. I expect many of us have scars, both visible on our body and inside our body in our hearts. The grief that persists, the wrongs that cannot be undone, memories that stay with us. Our scars, both visible and invisible, speak of who we are, what has shaped us and what we have overcome. Scars of Jesus serve as a sign of how hard won and costly was the victory. The scars of Christ are a reminder of the bravery, which is not the same as the bravado. Christ's wounds speak to a wounded world, a wounded church, wounded people. They reveal Jesus' willingness to go to the places of struggle and suffering. In front of the wounded, scarred Jesus, Thomas became the first disciple to declare him to be both Lord and God. This unshakable faith took him out to share the good news of Jesus, going further than any other disciple. In my opinion, he is wrongly known as Doubting Thomas. He should be known as Believing Thomas. We as a church, as a benefice, hold hurts and wounds. We have scars. Thomas made one mistake. He withdrew from his fellow disciples. He withdrew from Christian fellowship. He sought loneliness rather than togetherness. And because he wasn't with his fellow Christians, he missed the first coming of Jesus. We miss a great deal when we separate ourselves from Christian fellowship and when we try to be alone. We need fellowship with other Christians, safe places to ask questions, to discuss doubts, to renew our faith. Now, I know that we already have several Bible study and house groups running in our church community. I would really like to have many more of these Christian fellowship and support groups. I'm going to be holding a gathering in September. Um, I'm not entirely certain of the date yet, but it will be here at St. John's. For all those who are already in a Bible study or home group, and all those who would like to join one or start one. There'll be details on the pew sheet and the website soon, so please do seriously consider coming along. It will be from every stage, from beginners to the experts, whoever they are, <laughs> I want to join that group. In the meantime, if you'd like to chat with me about any concerns or questions that you have, just get in touch. Everyone says, oh, you're so busy. Yes, I am busy. There is lots to do. My diary does get quite filled. But I've always got time to meet with parishioners. Always. I will find time in the diary. So if you have got concerns or doubts or questions that you want to talk to me about, let's have a cuppa and a chat. We don't proclaim in our services Great is the mystery of faith, without very good reason. Faith is a mystery, but it's a mystery that we can seek together. Doubt can lead to answers that strengthen our faith, and doubt can lead us closer to God. 
It honestly isn't necessarily a bad thing to have doubts, provided that it leads to renewed faith. So today we remember that great apostle of huge faith, believing Thomas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, our rock and our refuge, there are so many things that we allow to erode our faith in you. When life gets stormy, we let our uncertainty cloud our trust in you. We think we know better and start relying on ourselves to be able to weather the storm. Lord, forgive our lack of hope and the disbelief that drowns us. Father, help us to hold on to you, our rock, and to build our lives on the foundation of your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, our anchor and our shelter. Amen. Now I've got a very short video for you to watch, which speaks into what I've said. Over a month, around 6% of the UK gather together to worship Jesus. It feels like we're too few to make a difference. But the reality is, Monday to Saturday, God has us. Scattered in the world, connecting to hundreds and thousands of people. So wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you do, you can make all the difference in the world. And on Sundays, when we gather together, we strengthen and empower one another to be sent out again for life on our front lines. Let us stand together to declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. O Lord, our Good Shepherd, you are the source of all true and lasting joy. We praise you for your power, which is beyond compare. We worship you for your wisdom, which is beyond understanding. You can meet all our needs, loving Lord. We thank you for all the clergy who lead the worship in the benefits Uphold them, and especially bishops, archbishops, Pope Francis, help them to work together to bring in your kingdom, Lord. 
Lord continued to strengthen Heather's recovery and Mick's support. Also we pray for the flower arrangers and Heather and Mick and the ministry team for the churches, especially St. Peter's Ovington, as they celebrate their patronal festival. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, Father, we thank you for answering all our prayers and once again, just recently the two British nationals captured and accused by criminal forces of mercenary activities. We earnestly pray, Lord, for the two men that leniency will prevail. The Afghanistan earthquake and suffering of people under the grip of the Taliban with no homes or shelter or food to go to. Almighty and most merciful God, whose son became a refugee and has no place to call his own, look with mercy on all those who today are fleeing from danger, homeless and hungry, and particularly the people who risk their lives in boats to reach this country. And also recently, those trapped inside a lorry in Texas. We thank you for the food and shelter we have. Bless those who work to bring them relief, inspire generosity and compassion in all our hearts and guide the nations of the world towards that day when all will rejoice in your kingdom of justice and of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, in your mercy. We remember all those who are sick in hospital or at home, recovering or facing a terminal illness. Pray for all carers, especially elderly family members who struggle to cope with the pressures. Pray for all who are lonely, anxious, feeling unloved. Lord God, whose Son, Jesus Christ, understood people's fear and pain before they spoke of them. We pray for those in hospital, surround the frightened with your tenderness, give strength to those in pain, hold the weak in your arms of love and give hope and patience to those who are recovering we ask this through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. And finally, we pray for the people of Maridi, that the work undertaken there by Lynn Treneri may bear fruit. Pray also for Lynn as she adjusts to her new life. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If they stand. Jesus teaches us to live with one another in peace and in love. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. both cathedral services yesterday, people were hugging and shaking hands. Things have changed in certain settings. <laughs> we're going to sing our next hymn on a piece of paper. Dear Lord, we long to see your face. Thank you. <laughs>
Yours, Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the splendor, and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning, you have created all things. And all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time, you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. How wonderful the work of your hands, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus, our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me.
Christ is the bread of life. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come in glory. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Remember, Lord, your church in every land. Reveal her unity, guard her faith, and preserve her in peace. Bring us at the last with St. Thomas and all the saints to the vision of that eternal splendour for which you have created us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed.
Almighty God, who on the day of Pentecost sent your Holy Spirit to the apostles with the wind from heaven and in tongues of flame, filling them with joy and boldness to preach the gospel. By the power of the same Spirit, strengthen us to witness to your truth and to draw everyone to the fire of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to stand together to sing our final hymn now. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Please would you stand. my final blessing I just would like to mention communion actually that uh, in both cathedrals yesterday we shared the chalice everybody did and talking to other priests most churches are now sharing the chalice so if you've got strong views one way or the other or any views could you let me or the church wardens know because we will discuss this at PCC um, whether or not we do go back to the chalice and the idea would be that you could receive or not Contentinct. You either receive from the chalice or you just receive in one kind. Um, so let me know your thoughts. That would be lovely. My final blessing for us this morning. The 
peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty the Father Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those that you love this day and always Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.